morning, but it's a bit of late. Good well, evening. it's morning to somebody. <laughs> somebody in Australia. In Australia, I'm sure. Yeah. Good morning. <laughs> exactly. Good evening. Hey, Charlotte. Good so we'll make Charlotte a panelist, right? Yep. Yep. Welcome, everybody. We're being joined this time yeah. by some of our team. Oh, Kristen is there. Which is really cool. Oh, Kristen, good. Kristen. Catherine, too. Catherine's here. Oh, yeah, cool. So we're going to have them join us for the conversation today. So, Which Kristen, you want to be united? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So she can decline. You can yeah. promote her to okay, panel. Okay. She can always decline. Yeah, we we'll want to chat can. about a training subject. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. No, they know, but she okay. she was in the chat. Good. Okay. I, yeah, I'm not up to date yet. I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> so, Me neither. So I just did this in German. <clears throat> so I didn't know what channel did behind the scenes. Well, you were in there. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, let's see here. And, Marcella, there you go. and Marcel is here. Good. Yeah. Good I think good. Carolyn can't make it because they're load shedding in South oh. Africa. I suspect I think, yeah. this is what happens there. So Welcome, everybody. We're going to talk today about how to get your horse to move sideways. Because hey. the pain. Oh, Hi, Charlotte. Hi, Catherine. This is a, an often <laughs> um, repeated subject that people struggle with. We've all struggled with it at some time or another, and it's worthy of talking about. So we want to talk about it. And we thought for fun, for good fun. We would bring on today our assistant teachers. This is not all of them because they couldn't all make it today for various reasons. But I'd like to introduce you to Charlotte Zetterberg. She is from Sweden. Say hello, Charlotte. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Lovely. And Catherine McCrum from London. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. And Marcella Becker from Germany. Hello, hello to everybody. Hello. <laughs> and of course, mm. us, Thomas and Shanna from mm. Portugal. <laughs> so. Oh, okay, okay, Christina. <clears throat> oh, I did somehow failed when I tried to make Christina. Oh, okay. And Kristen will be joining us in just a quick thought moment. maybe you had declined and. <laughs> it failed. <laughs> said no. no, but no, it happens yeah. sometimes. No, it happens. Promote to panelist. Okay, there we go. And yeah, if somebody so knew joins just as I'm trying to click on your name then I click on the wrong name or it just everything moves and then we end up bringing yeah. somebody else in <laughs> some <laughs> person <laughs> hey Kristen and it's Kristen. been a long time <laughs> <laughs> we were just on with Kristen yeah, last night Marcella too <laughs> yeah and Marcella earlier yeah. today yeah and Kristen guest turned my water into wine oh yeah you <laughs> took water into wine okay. that water earlier sorry funny joke um and Kristen guest from Canada one of our other assistant teachers mm -hmm. and students. <coughs> Welcome, yeah. everybody. Kristen, do you want to say hello? Hi. Hi. <laughs> yes. So, so. Yeah, go ahead. So we want to talk about a just training issue that came up in a, in a group randomly this morning, but it's a very common one. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, you know, maybe not everybody here is in our group. So I was thinking maybe everybody should just very briefly uh, introduce yourselves a couple of sentences so people mm. know who the talking heads are <laughs> you mean so, them them <laughs> yeah. or them not the audience but you know our panelists so maybe charlotte if you want to start yes just a little something about i, I am a fellow Christ practitioner and writing teacher from sweden and I assist uh, Catherine with the Feldenkrais work in the courses and also help out with uh, uh, the writing stuff with Thomas and the other uh, assistants. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Catherine, yeah. <laughs> you want to go next? I'll just call around here. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm um, a Feldenkrais practitioner from the UK. And I assist Thomas and Shanna with the rider exercises. And we also run a program together called the Aware Rider. And I have my own program uh, run through Ritter Dressage called Feldenfit, which is Feldenkrais, short Feldenkrais 
bites for helping with your um, seat, everything possible to do with your coordination and generally help you ride as well as you can. Yay. Wonderful. So Marcella, you're up next. <laughs> yeah, hi. I'm a dressage trainer from Germany and the connection to Rida Dressage goes back a long, long time when I had the luck to meet the two of them in the US and take lessons first in the US for a few years and then again in Germany. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Uh, I'm uh, a long-term student of Thomas and Shanna, and I'm an amateur rider, uh, but I help out kind of by, I think, sharing my uh, my struggles when I see other people that are having issues like the ones that I've had. I kind of come in with the... Uh, amateur perspective on how to how to train it yourself so that's what I do yeah, yeah for those who missed it last night we had a, a conversation um that's on YouTube you can find it and on Facebook with Kristen where we talked about her journey and how she's um potentially hopefully debuting her horse at Grand Prix this year yeah which is pretty exciting yes. yeah <laughs> All fingers crossed, thumbs <laughs> crossed, all the bits. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Excellent. So yeah. let's get moving. Let's get moving. So yeah. So just to yeah, preface the whole thing. So in, in one of the groups this morning, somebody <clears throat> had a question, you know, in our exercises in the courses, there's a, a lot of like lateral movements and all kinds of sideways exercises. And her horse was struggling. It's, it's a difficult horse who comes with a lot of baggage. Um, physical issues, training issues, you know, mental health issues that he brought with him from, you know, previous bad handling, bad training and so on. So he was really, um, he find, found it really difficult to move sideways in one direction, right? And that's something that <clears throat> you see a lot so when you when you ride a lot of horses, you teach a lot of students. Um, it's a surprisingly common uh, problem. And, you know, because I did so many clinics so many years with all types of horses and breeds and, you know, levels of, of training and so on. Um, there was this common thread often that a lot of horses didn't seem to be able to shift their weight to the other side of the body. They seemed to have picked like a favorite leg and then they leaned on that and that's it. Yeah. It's like one out of four, right? And they didn't want to use any of the other legs. And if you tried to make them, they thought they were going to kill them. You, well, you know, they were going to fall down and that was the end of them. And, you know, big drama sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered, is like, well, how can that be? They're born quadrupeds. They should know how to move on four legs. They should know how to balance themselves. But mm -hmm. apparently it's not as simple as that. So <laughs> at least with the weight of the rider on their back. And sometimes even, even without the weight on the rider, some horses really struggle. And <clears throat> the thing is, this um, shifting the weight from side to side is often not really addressed in, in traditional riding lessons or dressage lessons. At least, you know, my teachers don't really talk about that a whole lot, I have to say. But shifting the weight is necessary for the horse to be able to change the bend. It's necessary to be able to change direction. Um, they, have to be able, they have to be able to shift the weight so they can canter on both leads. Also, it also means that they, they need to be... Uh, need to be able to shift the weight so they can do simple changes and flying changes, right? Lateral movements always involve a weight shift to usually to the side in which the horse is supposed to go. And if the horse is unable, unwilling, whatever, to go in one direction, then that lateral movement is just not going to happen, right? So this will show up in a million different places. On the surface, it looks like they have nothing to do with each other. They're also different, flying change, half pass, leg yield, you know, changing direction, changing the bend, cantering on both leads. It looks like it's all disparate, right? It has nothing to do with each other, but it always, all goes back to the same root problem, shifting the weight, you know? And um, that unfortunately took me forever to figure that out. <laughs> so a lot of trial and error. And uh, so today I wanna talk a little bit about what do you do? How do you teach a horse to shift the weight? Like if he's convinced that, no, I don't have two legs on that other side, or I'm convinced these legs are going to snap right off and I'm going to fall down and die if I if I try. Um, what do you do? You know, instead so, of 
more leg, push harder, you know, <laughs> what else? <laughs> Kristen, yeah. Oh, just, I wanted to say, if people are having issues where their horse um, explodes, um, it could be that the horse isn't able, like, isn't comfortable taking the weight, because we had that problem with my thoroughbred, and that was kind of one of the big insights um, hmm. that, that that changed the direction. You said, you said he doesn't know where his feet are, like, he has no idea that he's connected to the ground in any way. Exactly. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, that's relatively common. And you're right. I mean, if, if a horse is insecure like that and you insist, no, you will go over there, then, yeah, they, some of them explode, right? And some some of them do other things that can be dangerous. And um, so people need tools, right? They need strategies. How how do you do this in such a way that you don't traumatize the horse, you don't kill yourself, <laughs> you don't kill the horse? So... I want to so hear from all of you, and we'll just go maybe one by one again. So maybe Charlotte, if you want to start again, <clears throat> how would you address that? Um, how I will address if a horse doesn't want to to uh, yeah, uh, then I will start from the ground, and I think I will start with what we call Felden horse in some sort of way, which is a way of approaching Feldenkrais to, to horses uh, from the ground. And I will do it in standing. I will explore how the horse shifts weight. I will do it with my hands. And I can, for example, uh, explore the relationship between the forelegs, which foreleg is the horse more comfortable to put weight on and how does he do it uh, the same between hind legs I can go diagonally um, and from side to side with them and I will sense my, with my hands and I will observe with my eyes and I can see things like what happens with with the neck what happens with the rib cage so I will not only be in the place where I have put my hands. Uh, and at the same, same time as I get information that I can use later on when I maybe start to walk, work the horse in hand in the arena, uh, it's also a way to, to teach the horse, to clarify for the horse that, okay, you can really have weight on this leg. And I can also sometimes help the horse if the horse has a pattern in some other parts of the body, uh, which makes it difficult to shift the weight. Uh, then I can clarify uh, that as well. So that is what I will start with. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I like what, how you say uh, you, you see the horse, you feel the horse through your hands, but you sense the horse too, in a way, with your whole body, right? It's energy. And then if you, touch the horse with your belly. We were talking about it in the German session earlier mm -hmm. with Marcella and, and Yvonne. It's like, yeah, and when, when I do that technique, I often like lean against the horse a little, touch the horse at least, right? And then we can create this little oscillation. It gives you just more sensory input, I guess. The, the bigger the area of contact is, the more you feel, right? So I, I like that. So it, it, it's like all channels are open, basically. You get information on all, on all possible channels. And uh, find it has a calming effect on the horse too. Yeah. Yes, and it's also a way uh, when you start to, to learn it, uh, mm -hmm. you also learn to move yourself, mm -hmm. uh, which you can use both when you do work in hand, you know, to shift weight and you do it with mm -hmm. your pelvis mm -hmm. um, between your legs and so on. So it's not really something that you are pushing with your hands. And you, it's more that you put them there, but you move from other parts of, of yourself. And it's a little bit like having eyes or ears on the fingertips mm -hmm. of your hands when, yeah. when you sense it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. It's really interesting. So, Catherine, just is probably not very different, right? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, Charlotte's pretty much, um, yeah, spelt out how I would start. And, um, the difference between Charlotte and me, Charlotte had a lot more experience in terms of the riding and being a riding instructor. 
Um, whereas when I was, you know, having difficulties with helping my horse move sideways, I didn't really have all her experience. So I only had the Felden horse and the Feldenkrais and the sensitivity of my hands and all that knowledge. Um, so it was an absolute lifesaver. So if you're on the sort of less experienced side in the riding, um, as Charlotte says, it's an absolutely great way to learn how when you move different parts of the horse and you find out the relationships between the different parts of the horse, you will discover how to use your own body in riding. For example, if your horse has got uh, trouble to shift to the right pair of legs and you're standing on the left and you put your hands on the horse's rib cage and you move the ribs a little bit together and up, you'll find that the horse shifts weight and you go, ah, I could do that in the saddle. Maybe I could do what I did with my hands with my leg. Mm -hmm. Or as Charlotte says, in hand as well. So you get this fantastic opportunity with less pressure and less stress, you know, than if you're riding, because if nothing happens, it doesn't really matter. Uh, my horse lets me know when I don't do something he doesn't like, very clearly. <laughs> yeah. So yes, pretty much the same. Um, fascinating with the you know pushing the yeah. ribs together, but yeah. sense in a way you kind of ask him to bend that way. Right? Yes, exactly. Together, the other ones have to spread out on the other side. Exactly, and when you move the ribs together, it gives space for the uh, effectively the inside hind leg, the leg on the inside of the bend to uh it takes enough weight off that hind leg for it to be able to come forward which is what you need isn't it for the exactly that's the, the weight to shift yep yeah, yeah so i i worked that out i would i would you know to be doing thomas's exercise and go well i can only go one way uh, let me <laughs> let me do one way ridden and the other way with my hands on <laughs> and eventually we worked it out yeah brilliant that's amazing, yeah. That's amazing yeah. and uh, uh the other thing that we learned from from you was that um you know if the horse doesn't want to i don't know <clears throat> the weight to the right rather than pushing him to the right so he leans harder against you you ask him to move more towards the side that he likes right in the hopes that at some point those legs will get tired and he wants to shift again right or or you can start initiate a rocking or sometimes i find if i or they move the horse move onto move. the loaded side there is this ricochet effect a yeah, little exactly. bit where the horse has to re rebound a little well, they have this natural sense to want yeah. to recalibrate and come back to yeah. center and if you bring them if they're already leaning one way, if you bring them off more that way, then their natural sense to want to rebalance kicks in and they bring themselves back center, more center again. Yeah, and I think that's really spot on what you two have just said, because in a sense, it's the same for us. Say mm -hmm. I'm very committed to putting weight through my left leg. Um, I'm already so far over my left leg that if I even go a little bit further, I put myself in danger of falling. Yeah. And so the moment that someone moves me even further, I recalibrate, as you say, Shanna, yeah. by not coming back to where I was on the left leg, but actually coming a bit to the right of it. It's almost like the nervous system, the vestibular system, which is in charge of our balance, right. work to restore the equilibrium. It's a very peculiar thing, but it's really worth trying out. So rather than always trying to correct what you see as wrong, go a yeah. little bit with what the horse I is already doing. Are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> move them and... Yeah, right? nature's yeah. gonna go. Oh, you move over, you move over more. You know, yes, and yes. That go, oh, what are you yes. Say, come this way, come this way, even more. Yes, so and it's also what? very polite. You're going, oh, you like to go this way. Uh, let's take you a little bit more, and then then the horse goes, no, I don't like to go that way after all. Not yeah. quite as much <laughs> as I thought. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. it's a, quite an elegant solution. Yeah, and it's very different from the old school dressage approach where you will move over because I said so. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, and I think that's right. And we've been, I've, I've seen that there was a question about um, someone asked about leadership in one of the, maybe in the What Why How course, actually. And there was a very interesting thread about leadership. And mm -hmm. I think where a lot of people came to was that when you work with the way that you do, Thomas and Shanna, and hopefully how Charlotte and I, Mar Marcella and Kristen, and all the instructors, it's about a partnership with your horse. Um, so yes, you are you're clear in your intentions, but it's about a partnership rather than a domination, and and I think that is a a very very key difference. Yeah. 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 I was a lady who I think she's still you know more or less a beginner, and she takes yeah. lessons on lesson horses in a typical lesson barn, right? Mm. So which is always a difficult sit situation. And the, the I think one of the teachers told her be more of a leader, and I thought oh that's a bit of a mm difficult term like what does leader mean is that showing who's boss and you know or what does that mean that's why you know, i explained a little bit you know get to know the horse and yeah, you know, yeah it was a really things. interesting thread that yeah, yeah really interesting and i think what came out of it thomas and it's you know for those of you listening was that um you know everybody had their tales to tell and it became clear as i read through it that each horse needs a 
little bit different level of support. You know, some horses need a bit firmer intention mm. and clear support and other horses like mine really mm. need to feel like they're in charge, but mm. not so much that I'm in danger. You know, it's so it, to calibrate my own um, presence with with each horse. I'm, I mean, I don't work with so many horses, but I'm starting to understand I need to calibrate my presence to be more up or more down accordingly. But that's mm. very different from lifting my aggression and my force up or down more forcefully. So, yeah, it was a fascinating thread that. Lots yeah. of really interesting discussions in that group. Yes, yeah. Yeah, really. That's very true. Well, Marcella. <laughs> I, um, I like the direction this discussion is going. And I had to smile because um, when we did the German version earlier, the Feldenhorst came up. Mm -hmm. And um, this is really something where I can thank Charlotte for, um, with all the input also from Ka from Catherine on Feldenkrais. Um, and what I like about this is um, that I call it sometimes Felden human because it, it gets the human down and relaxed where it can be. And it brings horse and human together, and yes. um, and and this is sort of the main thing to to even get that partnership going that then can lead to this stepping over. So I like um, I like this direction of the conversation very much. And um, one thing to the point that you made, Catherine, about partnership versus domination. I, I hear that when I teach some place in some arenas in Germany, sometimes there are other lessons going on and there's still this saying, well, you show the horse now who's the boss. Mm -hmm. And um, I really have an issue with that if I see a rogue beginner that does everything wrong that we all do wrong when we're a rogue beginner. Um, and then this person is supposed to show the horse the who is boss. Um, mm. I, I do think there's something that one also has, has to earn. Otherwise, it's really unfair to the horse. Mm. This doesn't mean that they can step all over us, but mm. partnership. So mm. you can only request what from the horse what you can give to the horse. Um, and then it can develop from there. And I think with that approach, you get less so-called problem horses, um, because what I see with this domination approach that still is partly prevalent, you get either horses that are very quiet, um, they don't speak anymore, or you get other horses that are really taking up the middle finger and then they are the bad ones and none of them will learn in such an environment. So, so as I called it earlier in the German version, this kind of work is the basis of the basis of the basis. And it's important. Yes. Yeah, very true. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. So Kristen, how would you approach that? Like if a horse either doesn't shift the weight or doesn't go sideways or, you know, how would you do so, that? So I want to come at this, I guess, from, from inside. So amateur me <laughs> and what I've, what I've learned by trying to do things. And so mm -hmm. it, it, I guess this is the things you can think about for yourself rather than what you're trying to do to the horse. Um, and for me, I tend to be a bit of a ticky box person and that's a really bad thing. So it's like, there's, there's things to do. And somebody asked a question about the course. And I was looking at it on Facebook this morning before I came on and they were like, I, I'm, I'm not a beginner and my horse isn't a beginner. So do I have to start at module one? And I was like, that's me, right? Like marching through the modules and being done with it. And, and the fact is that like, that's ticky boxes. And if you do that, you're missing all the nuance <laughs> and you're not, you're, you're, you're losing. They have to kind of keep circling back in. So Ticky box me is horse needs to move over. Like Charlotte says, you know, it's it's best to start that stuff on the ground before you try to do it on, you know, like, but even on the ground, it's like, okay, we're going to move you over. And then I've ticked the box. Yes, my horse moves. And so there's no quality in that. And anyway, one of my horses taught me why that's a bad thing to do. He's really big. He was a baby, sweet, willing but with zero body awareness. Mm -hmm. And I would, I was asking him like, okay, dude, like we're going to, we're going to move your shoulders. We're going to move your quarters. We're going to do this. We're going to, you know, like, and, and he just couldn't like, and he would stand there and just sort of tremble or lock up. And I thought, mm -hmm. okay, he can't like, 
Yeah. We got to go for, can he just move like this much? Like, can he just in the, you know, go in the direction of trying and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, so we had to start, go back to like, not here's a great big movement. <laughs> it's, we have to do a tiny movement and mm -hmm. then we have to have a party for him <laughs> and he has to feel great about that. And he just, and we just keep patiently doing that until he, his brain and his feet are wired enough that it's possible for him to do one step. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that was really successful with him, like, because he wanted to, he just, he needed that time and mm -hmm. that space and that patience yeah. to be able to figure it out. And so eventually we got there and, you know, but it's like, you, you, you've got to meet each horse as they are. Um, you know, so my main riding horse has, an as amazing body awareness it's never been any issue for him to do anything mm -hmm. um but they're not all like that and the and so what the the struggling horse taught me was how much quality i was losing in the ones that were body aware because if you say move over and they just like go slam over and you know like that's not you're not teaching them anything they need for their posture or that you're like they need to be able to move over eventually mm -hmm. with engagement <laughs> And in control, like, and as and in controlled ways, as mm -hmm. you know, as finely great as you can get that if you're willing to put the time in. And so it's like ticky box me was just like, I say move, you move, but we have <laughs> we haven't really gained anything by doing that. So I think that my way, I guess it's it's like the what we're talking about here, it kind of starts with not with how do you move the horse, but how does the person <laughs> approach moving the horse? Mm -hmm. And how is the person getting the most out of the exercise, which is the horse is going to tell you things while mm -hmm. you're doing it that are really, really important and that mm -hmm. you can use. And if you ignore those things, that that's when you're going to end up with the, you know, with explosions or with a horse that shut down, like Marcella says, if you don't listen, eventually they will, they will either rebel because it's unjust or they will, they will just sign out. And in some ways the, the, the horse that's left the, the conversation is, the much harder nut to crack <laughs> like getting them to to trust you and come back in is is really hard and so you know so if you start to think about the quality and think about what what it's okay to ask right now in this moment and build it in a way that allows them to start to trust you you get a whole lot more things than just the movement out of that it's true there's so much more to it right than just going sideways and it's it's important really to to think about these things about everything that's involved because that also leads you to well why is he not moving over right it should be an easy thing to do but there could be any number of of reasons why he won't do it I mean there's all, one thing we haven't mentioned is that maybe he's injured right maybe it hurts so that's always something yeah, to to always check you know and, and you know if it suspicious call of it right or maybe he had an injury it's all healed it's all good nothing hurts but he doesn't believe it. You know, he says, I knew it hurt once upon a time, and I'm sure it will hurt again, so I'm not going there, you know. And that's a difficult situation, too, is how do you convince him then that, you know what, it's okay, it won't hurt. And that, that's tricky, too, just maybe even more difficult than the horse that just doesn't know where his feet are, right? Because then you have to really get the horse to take one baby step. You'll see, you won't die, you know, nothing will break off, you know, that sort of thing. That can be really, mm -hmm. really challenging, but... It's interesting now, you know, with all of our different perspectives, how that, that like gives a, yeah, a big picture kind of thing, right? The relationship, the body awareness, the balance, and then all these all these things, they're all important. They all play a role. And absolutely. Yeah, you know, when you know, so you know, <clears throat> when when you ride and you come come from it from a like very practical thing, you're maybe even you're on the horse, you ride something, you you think, oh, I'm gonna do this. And it's like, nope, not work, not happening, right? And then it's like, hmm, what do you mean you're not doing that? Right? That shouldn't be that hard. Right, then you take it down a level. Well, how about this? This is easier, but it's kind of the same spirit, right? Same idea. No, not happening. And then you go down and down. It's like like you know, when you when you start in a tall building, you have to go down by the stairs, once one flight down, another flight down, another flight down <laughs> until you find the exit or that you're on solid ground, right? And so and then when you do that, then you you end up sometimes with this. Yeah, Felden horse. Well, like it doesn't get any easier th than that in a sense from from the horse's perspective. It's nothing physically challenging. It's not sport. It's not you know it doesn't, the horse won't break a sweat. He won't get out of breath. It's like you know, 
nothing, you know, in a way, but that's sometimes where you have to start. Where like, like Marcella says, the absolute rock bottom foundation where you cannot yeah. get any lower, right? Unless you dig a yeah. hole. <laughs> so you know, but uh, and that that's important to realize that when you need to do that, because it's often like, oh, I'm so surprised. I'm so surprised. A lot of people say, Well, that's ridiculous, you know, he's gotta do it. He knows X number of years old, he's shown that level and it's like, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> Fine. Yeah, and if I can, if I can just come in, like what Marcella's, you know, point about beginners, like my biggest problem when I landed on your doorstep with my thoroughbred was that, you know, I had all the best intentions in the world, but I did not have the skills. So I was, you know, with my Charles to Comfy book and like, here, we're going to do these things and gymnasticize the horse. What I didn't understand is all of the things that have to go on before you start doing what's often presented to us as the starting point or the basic. So I was throwing that poor horse onto, le onto hind legs that didn't want to flex. Mm -hmm. And he was responding by, mm -hmm. by like jamming his pole <laughs> and mm -hmm. And then, and then he'd jam his pole and I'd grab his, his, his mouth and then he'd, you know, and then he'd explode, right? Like he was, he had nowhere to go and he was a thoroughbred. And so he would explode and then he was a bad, you know, horse. And so you're trying to attack this thing that you have to back up, you know, like before you start <laughs> bending. A lot. There's a lot to do before that point to explain things to the horse, to build the skills and understanding. Yes, but. I mean, and yeah. it, it came up yesterday, like the, you know, when someone says, stretch your horse, put your hands forward, and they'll go to the bed, you know, that happens <laughs> about 0.1% of the time, right? <laughs> it's, it takes a whole lot of work to get to the point where you put your hands forward and the horse goes with you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unless it's, uh, right. you know, that's very talented. <laughs> so, Marcella, yes, Marcella. If I might jump in on that, um, also when, when, the comment that you made, Kristen, in a way, it's the horses that don't function that um, really teach us the most. And um, I, too, when I learned stuff, you know, I did it. Um, and then at some point you came across or I came across a horse, especially with the stepping over. I did a basic thing, stepping over. Yeah. And then it took me half an hour to work with the horse until he was actually breathing again. Mm -hmm. um, that made me think and reconsider and um, kind of reevaluate how do I approach what. And um, those experiences are really, really valuable um, because then it prepares us for other horses that are also sensitive or with bad experiences beforehand. And also mm -hmm. horses, I mean, I've met horses that had been ridden Grand Prix mm -hmm. um, and they couldn't step over. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just Pardon. like Grand Prix jumper that were afraid of trotting a pole. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, whatever they did under high, high pressure doesn't in a way mean that they learned it and really feel it and understand it. Um, yeah, it can be quite the opposite. Yeah. <clears throat> True. Reminds me of, of, of something um, what Kristen was saying, you know, with the talented horse, it's really easy to get them to go mm -hmm. anywhere, forward, backward, sideways, anything is easy, right? They do it. And because it's, they do it easily, you may not look at the quality. And of course, you see that with a with a really talented warmblitz, they often get pushed up the levels and they do all kinds of tricks, but they don't understand anything of what they're doing. You know, it's, I guess it's a little bit like somebody singing a, a song in a foreign language. They have no idea what the words mean, but they sing it, right? And the words come out, and but they have they couldn't have a conversation in that language. They don't know, you know, what anything means. Goodness. And I've I've ridden horses like that too. It's like, how how did they do this level of competition? The horse yeah. hasn't even learned like his ABC. He has he knows nothing there's so many holes right or but the neck is round and you, you can yeah push they, him around a little they bit sort right? of memorize yeah. the things like they can do shoulder in in a certain place but if you ask for shoulder in somewhere else yeah. oh well yeah, no, no, no. break loose no, no. because yeah. it's not possible yeah. you know it it's not in their lexicon you yeah. know yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly the... yeah Kristen, you want to say something i just wanted to say that in the first clinic i went to with you um a very, a very high level horse showed up. And I think the idea was they wanted to work on 
PF or something anyway. <laughs> you, I think you told them that they needed to do corners. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, I mean, and that's like, and you told, you told me at the beginning when we were starting my, my liposon, um, mm. you know, we were doing corners and, you know, it like just at, at a really basic level. And you said the end of this road is the pirouette. Yes. Like it's, you know, like, so everything starts from something very small and very basic. And if you don't respect that, mm -hmm. you don't eventually, you know, eventually you hit the ceiling. Yeah. yeah. Great point. Very true. Yeah. That's true. I remember the, the horse you're talking about. Actually, mm -hmm. it was a beautiful horse. I, I would have loved to own that horse. Um, yeah, he was showing, I think, intermediate or something like that. And I tried to do a 20 meter square, you know, one side shoulder in and then the other side haunches in and he couldn't do it. And I was like, how do you show intermediate when a horse can't do a second level movement? Second basically? level exercise. Yeah. 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 But it's just, it doesn't show up in a second level test like that. Right? Yeah, exactly. The arrangement of the elements is different. He didn't recognize it. So that's a little bit the, the difference between like trick training, right? Memorizing. Mm -hmm. And tricks, skill training. And, uh, and edu training. Yeah, yeah, educating. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's really, sometimes you're really baffled. You know, it's kind of things you see. And, it, and I was, wonder how they do that because i didn't <laughs> I, I couldn't ride an advanced test with a horse like that because you oh. wouldn't you wouldn't yeah you know? right. <laughs> i couldn't I know. maybe these people are more talented than me <laughs> but i couldn't i couldn't it's just, just yeah so i have to do it a little systematically but uh you know also what 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 starting to or what's emerging here a little bit is that um you kind of need to know how the bits and pieces fit together. You need to know how one thing builds on another, how one thing is a stepping stone to the next. Like, what's the prerequisite that the horse needs to know to be able to do this step? And what's the prerequisite for this? And can you take these prerequisites further apart? You know, it's like you have big molecules, you can break them into atoms, and then you can take the atoms apart into your electrons and neutrons and protons and blah, blah, blah. So so that's how I think of, of our, you know, movements and exercises that you have to basically divide them until you reach the smallest particle that makes up that universe, right? And until you get to a point where you cannot go any lower, you cannot make it any simpler, you cannot split this into partial movements or anything. There's always, there's got to be this rock bottom, right? Where it doesn't go any simpler. And that's often where you have to start. And then you have to know how do you combine these little... Like how many basic particles are there in the universe, right? And how can I combine them so they make other things? And, you know, so then you, you build gradually more complex movements until you have your whatever, you know, tempo changes and pirouettes and piaf and passage and so on. But if you just think, well, I just need to, I don't know, push this button or, you know, whatever, and then the horse will do a, a nice piaf, you know, when he doesn't have all the, the previous education, of course, it's not going to work, right? <laughs> so... So. Um, sometimes the horse is not the biggest problem. It is the rider, uh, mm -hmm. for example. It can be that you are not, uh, you have to be aware of your own midline. Mm -hmm. And then the connection between your midline and the horse's midline, because then you can work, for example, easier with pole vaulting into uh, different legs. Uh, and you can also be, you can follow in the motion. Uh, a very common uh, thing you can do is that you are a little bit behind. So you are not aligned with the horse's spine. You are a little bit like this. You are leaning and you are pushing with, with your leg. And then even if the horse is doing a good movement, so trying to do a good movement, you are not aligned you are not following in the motion and that can be uh, due to your own uh, uh, crookedness asymmetry mm. uh, but it can also be just that you uh, are not really well aware of how to connect with the horse's movement and to be in sync with them mm -hmm. uh, that's a good point. So far, we've come at it from the horse side of, you know, mm -hmm. things, assuming the horse has an issue. But you're right. I mean, it's always two sides of the coin. Yeah. Maybe the horse has no problem. Maybe it's the rider <laughs> who's not communicating. <laughs> so, yeah. 
So, or you know, if, if people you know, shift their weight in the wrong direction, and then there's a contradiction between the leg and the seat or the weight. You know, and the weight is sort of the more natural aid for the horse. It's just physics, right? They they tend to kind of follow the weight. But if your weight says go that way and my leg says go that way, what is the horse going to do, right? So most likely he's going with the weight and he's ignoring the leg, which means he's going against my leg. He's disobedient, you know. Well, maybe so, he's not. Yeah, you exactly. Know? <laughs> maybe yeah. he's obeying the weight, you know, maybe yeah. he's going with the weight. Yeah. So, yeah, there's many factors involved. We have to look at everything. Well, this yeah, goes back to, to what I said earlier with um, how much can we tell the horse what to do. And I find that in writing, um, in a lot of things that we do write, um, we have to give the horse with our body what we want the horse to do for us with their bodies. So, yeah, if I want to go in a certain direction, I have to be able to move my weight there. Um, if I tilt or fall, I can't expect the horse to be in a good balance balance. So in, in a way, um, I always prioritize the work on the rider. Um, mm -hmm. Because if the rider gets it right, um, the horse has a good chance to do a good job. Exactly. And I find that in lessons, um, if things kind of meh, don't go that well, or the rider gets frustrated, I say, you know what, just ignore the horse for a little bit and just ride yourself. Mm -hmm. And then um, we do that for a while. And um, lo and behold, so far, if the rider gets herself figured out and calmed down and the focus just on her and not on what the horse is doing or not doing, then the horse can do. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, is, that is so true. Mm -hmm. I sort of my mantra is the least athletic horse I've ever been near is 10,000 times more athletic than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning as well is that if you are not in your middle yourself, yeah. then that means you're going to be very actively contracting one side of your musculature or your muscles in your front or your muscles in your back, which actually makes it very, very difficult to move in certain directions. <clears throat> Already you've set yourself up for a disadvantage in terms of this main question that we're asking, how do we move our horse sideways? Mm -hmm. yep. So it's really important that you know where your midline is and you get a sense of where your midline is in relationship to your horse. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't only mean like sitting up like this, it means front, back, mm -hmm. right and left, mm -hmm. twist right, twist left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you tipping? Not. Yeah, exactly. And there's also this, which we call the sort of horizontal translation, where maybe your pelvis is slid a little bit to the right and your ribs and shoulders are slid a bit to the left, like an S-shaped spine. So these are the sort of possibilities of our asymmetries. Mm -hmm. um, and the more you're conscious of them, the more you'll notice when you're out of your middle and the impact that's having on your horse yeah. and yeah. why you're making it difficult for that, for, for him or her to go sideways. Yeah, and I, yeah, in the beginning I was saying how, you know, the horses need to be able to support themselves with the left pair of legs and the right pair of legs, but we need to be able to do that too, right? Because if we can only sit on one seat bone, then the horse is never going to move in the other direction or support himself with the other side, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people are often not, not aware, of course, that they're always sitting on that one seat bone or standing on that one leg. You know, and that's where Feldenkrais is such a brilliant method to to bring awareness right? and, and free people up so they can move in, in more ways than one. <laughs> so, you know. Yes. And often, you know, what, what has to be very obvious to us in order to feel that we're out of alignment or asymmetrical mm -hmm. um, is, you know, for the horse, they feel much smaller degrees of lack of balance. And uh, so you have to develop your sensitivity and your ability to pay attention to yourself on an internal level in order to be able to feel the levels of subtlety that your horse can feel in you. Uh, so it's a, it's a sort of learning process, isn't it? A, a process of self-observation. Yeah, very much so. Which also involves a lot of um, issues of mindset and stress management or whichever way you want to call it. 
Um, mm. And yeah, all these things do lead to contracted muscles. And mm -hmm. if, um, if it becomes a habit, then it's even harder to figure it out because then that's the normal for the body. So um, I, I always find that when I work with people on my writing simulator, um, where they, they start out fairly crooked and sometimes they just sit on there and because of the way it works, the body comes to, how do I want to say it? It comes to a certain rest which then makes it possible mm -hmm. to activate the muscles that are needed to, to do writing with the least amount necessary. So yes. mm -hmm. to be efficient. Yeah. 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 And it makes, it makes people relaxed and calm, which is really cool. <laughs> the horses nice. love it then. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting. It's brilliant. Yeah. And and it's true when you're when you're sitting in balance, you don't need a lot of muscles, right? Because you won't fall off. Yeah. And if you're out of balance, you have to grip and hold on because otherwise you do fall off, right? Yeah. So that reminds me of the things Catherine always uh, says that you know when she does the Feldenkrais lessons that you you know, use as little strength as you can and can you still breathe and and you know as soon as you lose the quality and you tighten up somewhere then you know do less and. Yeah, so for, for the writer in the saddle, that would be a good reminder sometimes. Mm -hmm. that could I do this with less physical effort? <laughs> could I push a little less? <laughs> could I hold a little less? You know, could I relax a little bit more in my arms and legs, especially? You know, so, and that's only possible if you're in balance. Huh? Yeah, so I'd love to hear from those that are attending in here to put into the chat um, what are the issues you have with have go sideways movements with mm -hmm. getting your horse to go sideways with coordinating at all mm -hmm. do you have any questions around this we can dive in a little mm -hmm. bit deeper and give you a little help yeah there read a couple comments. of these yeah comments sabine Pora says i like your idea to do things not at the traditionally dedicated places in the arena that was a game changer for me for example the chessboard uh -huh. my mayor was almost embarrassed that she should do a corner somewhere in the arena <laughs> and i needed also all my concentration and orientation to do it but we're getting better <laughs> yeah that's often a rude awakening if you try to write something you've done a million times but do it in a different place or different <laughs> context and the horse is like i've never heard of this before i can't do this <laughs> 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 that's why it's good to practice that it's a you know interesting thing with say for instance dancers who do a lot of their practice in front of a mirror and then yeah. you take the mirrors away how difficult it can be and the other thing was with martial arts um feldenkrais who developed the method that charlotte and i teach he would teach a judo role which means that you start you kind of somersault and you want to end up orientated to a particular part of the room and people would be able to do it in one direction they learned it only to do it so they would end up facing the front of the room. And so then he would yeah. turn them around and they were completely all over the place. Then you put them to the facing the right side and they just, you know, it was chaos. Mm, that, oh, so, good point. Okay, yeah. Well. So, you know, neuro, you know, we always have this idea that the, these, these ways of learning are neurological and that the neurological learning is also related to the space, the external environment, not only, you know, yourself and your own movements. So, so it's for us too. A very different thing from strength and stretching. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And then Juri Castania says, don't forget that the saddle fit can be a part of this balance mm -hmm. issue. My saddle desperately needs to be reflocked, probably, and it puts me to the left a lot. Yeah, I'm always fixing that, but definitely don't blame my pony for not doing what I ask. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, yeah, you should always check these things, you know, saddle, tack, uh, feed, teeth, and uh, make so sure on. the horse isn't in pain or uncomfortable in some way. It would be unfair to, mm. to overlook that. So Heather Williams says, do you sit on the left if you are half passing to the left? Uh, normally, yes. That's, you know, the Classical teaching says you always sit on the inside seat bone, right? And um, usually it makes sense to sit in the direction of the movement, you know. But, I mean, sometimes I break the rule because, for example, if I'm going in the horse's stiffer direction and the inside hind leg is stepping short and the horse is not bending well. In the course of training, yeah, it's not the finished the, exactly. product. Yeah. So sometimes when I feel that I'm, the inside hind is starting to lag behind, I sometimes sit on the outside hind leg and drive the inside hind leg forward. Mm -hmm. Two, th two three strides and I feel like when I feel like that hind leg has caught up 
then I drop my weight onto it again. Because if you sit on the inside hind leg and the inside hind is stepping short, then you're preventing that hind leg from coming through and underneath you. Yeah. But if I can't fix that within <clears> two rides, I abandon my half pass, I ride a volta or shoulder in something or other, you know, to get that inside hind underneath me. And then I resume the half pass. There's always a bit of a, a time frame because if you can't fix something within the gate or within the movement within like a you know three to six stride time frame, it's probably not going to happen even in the next hundred strides or a thousand strides, right? It just gets worse and worse. So that's why at some point I cut my losses, like, okay, that didn't work, and do something else, right? Out of my half pass, get that inside hind leg going, bend the horse, and then try to resume again. Or, yeah, yeah. And do something that reinstates his ability or her mm -hmm. ability to be able to mm -hmm. bend and put the weight where you want yeah. to for him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if, so. if I may chime in on that, um, this is why I think it is so important for the writers to really um, be able to sit in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, because then if you have a middle well established or as, as best established as you can, then you can start working individual adjustments as the horse might need it during a movement or during um, a circle or whatever you ride. And I do find that this is still a big issue for a lot of riders, even riders that are riding movements. Um, and so, so, yeah, I, I just find it extremely important as the basis. Again, for the rider, the basis of the basis. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me actually, like many years ago, I, I used to think of this as having like a home base for my seat where it's sort of neutral, you know, mm -hmm. in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then to, to influence the horse, I may have to leave that home base, you know, go in any one direction right to to make a change in the horse but then come back to that home base and be neutral again right and then do mm -hmm. another thing another sortie <laughs> to another direction right and then you go back to the middle so i haven't thought about that in a long time but i found that useful for a while you know this idea you have your neutral zone mm -hmm. where you're just cruising along you know just monitoring the horse and then when you need to change something you you leave that but you return to it you know so i don't know it helped me for a while Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think Marcella's hit on something really important. Um, and I was sitting here thinking that, you know, like w a lot of times people who ride or people in general with whatever it is that you know, you've done something for a long time, you start to think of yourself as like, I know this, I am, you know, like, and, and, and I find it's always, there's always these moments for me where I, it's like, humility <laughs> where I discover that I have be you know like that I need to go back and check myself that you know that 99 percent of the time the pilot is the problem and yeah. and it's it's very basic stuff in me I will get hyper focused on the horse you know being straight or doing this or that and then and then you kind of back up and you go oh my goodness well that's <laughs> not <laughs> the horse is not straight because the pilot is not straight and you know and there it's not like you progress towards that you know and it's like oh i'm in this state of perfect zen you know like <laughs> excellence in myself it's like you you have to kind of keep going back and checking in on that because it's really easy Definitely. to lose the, the 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 basic alignment of yourself yeah that's true and it's easy especially when you're start trying to write stuff you know mm -hmm. movements you get focused on certain things and then you may forget to breathe and then you may, I don't know, start muscling a bit because, you know, trying to get it done. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that's always a danger. So it's good, like you say, to step outside of yourself and, and look, what am I doing? And uh, am I still breathing? And do I need to relax more? And, you know, these, these kind of things. Uh, I have to do that too sometimes. And, uh, yeah, rib cage for me is an an issue, and I, holding my breath is an issue when I'm focused on something. I really have to remember to breathe, and and you know, and sometimes I find it even helps if you just sort of move a little bit, you know, just to check: am I still flexible? Even mm -hmm. like if it's not an aid, I'm not trying to do anything with the horse or tell the horse anything. It's just like, you know, am I still, or am I rigid? You no, know? rigor mortis, right. <laughs> you know, or with my pelvis too. It's like in. The walk, you know, can be vulnerable a little bit to, you know, stiffness, tightness and, and issues and stuff. So and, um, it's especially for men, it's, it's easy to, to get really stiff in the hips and not move. Right. So I, I 
sometimes check, am I still moving enough with the horse left and right? Mm -hmm. Which means sometimes then I exaggerate that, right? Because I I may think that I'm relaxed, but what do I know, right? I mean, you're, you're so in, in your, I don't know, little bubble that you, you don't really know if, if that's really enough movement, what you think, you, when you think you're moving, moving, I'm relaxed and so on. But maybe you're not. Maybe the horse needs twice that much, right? So then, then I, I check. I just go exaggerate. And if my horse suddenly gets a lot better, then I know I was just, I was stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing of, of, well, what I think I'm doing and what I'm actually doing are uh, two different things sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the body, you know, lies to us sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes when you get tight or stop breathing and get tension, uh, mm -hmm. you lose your timing. For example, you start maybe to grip in the reins or if you are going to give a leg aid, you are not uh, releasing in between. So it's just that you are pressing instead of going with the horse's rhythm, which means that you give an aid and you release and then you give an aid yes. uh, again and so on wh whenever you need to, to, to give an aid. Uh, and then you need to, to know what the horse is doing with the different body parts, especially with, with the legs. And also you talked about rib cage, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's say that you are not really, you can't sense how the swing is, and then maybe you give the aid or the exaggeration of, of um, the, the leg movement, uh, so you are out of sync, and then you will just disturb the horse's balance. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If I, um, this is such a good point with the aids. Um, that they should be given one point and then go away and listen to the horse because it should be a conversation. And I also have to think of music. Um, music teacher once told me, you have to play the breaks. Um, mm -hmm. You play the notes, the tones, but the breaks are important. Otherwise, you know, it, it just gets all jumbled. And I think with the writing, it's it's a bit like playing music too. Yeah. Yeah, very true. I, actually, that that's something that really resonated with me like years ago. It wasn't a Debussy who said music is the space between the notes or something mm -hmm. like playing and, something and, like that. Yeah, that that actually played a big role for me with the writing. That yeah, the release is more important than the aid. It was sort of <laughs> sort of a mantra, right? Mm -hmm. Only if you release, then the horse knows where the aid begins and where it ends, right? And if there's no release, then it's all just one big <laughs> holding pushing, you know, grabbing, you know, and then means nothing to the horse, right? It can help to focus more on the release. So instead of thinking mm -hmm. about giving the aid, you are focusing on the pause in between. So that is what you're sort of counting or, or focusing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Just... for me, it was important because I had a tendency to grip and to hold you know, when I was young. So and I had to really train myself to stop doing that. <laughs> so. I was just going to say, um, Charlotte, I remember when we first started teaching the Aware Rider and the lessons, the live lessons, Feldenkrais lessons in the Aware Rider. So when I was teaching, I couldn't see any of the audience. And she said, oh, in between each instruction, give, take three breaths yourself. And that was so useful because mm -hmm. I think it also pertains to what you guys are saying. Yeah. Is that actually for yeah. the words that I had, the words to lead people through these series of movements, I needed to have the pauses between for the words to have any impact. Right. Yeah. Because unless yeah. the instruction lands and people have time for it to land, yeah, then they're just sort of rushing from one slightly pressured state to the next. So I yeah. think that's very relevant to what you guys are talking about. So yeah. that's... It's a way to experience maybe what your horses feel in themselves is to, you know, when you're pushed by an instructor, and I've had that experience, I'm sure you have, where it's just rat a tat a tat and do this, do that. The in the tension that I get in myself, in my mind and in my body um, is so palpable. It's really, really quite unpleasant. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's maybe a little bit what happens to the horses when, it's, when there's never any release. So mm -hmm. I love that, Charlotte, what you said. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And it, it's interesting. I mean, there, this you can experiment with this um, with this idea. So you can do what Marcella said: aid, release, listen, aid, release, and listen. Right? 
you can also give an aid and listen at the same time. Like I, I think of the aid sometimes as a probe, like it's, it's an energy signal that you send into the horse's body. And then while you're giving the aid, how is that traveling through the horse's mind and body? How is he receiving that? Like how is he feeling about it or thinking about it? And how far does it go? Because you know, when I give an aid, I have a target in mind that I want to reach with the aid. So does it go to the target? Does it get blocked? Somewhere does it exit because there's a hole in, you know, false bend of some sort, hypermobile spot. That's a really interesting thing. It's like as you apply the A, try to, to feel and, and listen to how the horse is, you know, processing that. And then still release, <laughs> of course, you yeah. know. So just food for thought. So, but, uh, I mean, in a way, what you just described is when you have the horse... Um, supple and through i mean it's throughness if you give an aid and then you can almost feel it rippling through the entire body um mm -hmm. so but but yeah sometimes that's the goal and yeah. not and when they're not supple and through then you you feel when does it yeah. stop yeah yeah because then, then it's in, in, uh, important information right then you you send your signal out and then you, you it goes to this point and here it stops because there is a like a blocked muscle or, or something and then you can work on that area maybe or can how do i get this area to let go so the energy can travel a little farther right then you can think of what exercise would loosen that up or what can i do to loosen that up you know so yeah. excuse me um, we have some good questions yeah if you want to get to yeah naomi says my very green frisian now that's a um, twister my very green Frisian, my very green, my very <laughs> green, green Frisian pickles. <laughs> green Frisian. Okay, is falling in on the twenty meter circle. No more wine for you. <laughs> As he finds his balance under saddle without a wall. How can I help him hold and return to the line of travel safely without extreme side steps? Okay. Without having to resort to right, a right. pass, which is yeah. So falling in. So does that mm -hmm. happen in both directions or just one? I would think it would probably happen in one direction more than another. Oh, she says both. Okay. Both. Okay. 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 So yeah, and yeah. I don't know if I don't know if this helps. Like, if I can speak for some of the people, I think someone else is having a similar thing, and so am I at the moment because <laughs> I have a a really green horse <laughs> who, like, on his. On his, like he, it's like he's a Jekyll and Hyde. Like the the two sides are so different, um, <laughs> but I think it's I think what happens is you get you get one way where you don't have bend yet so they're kind of falling like <laughs> they don't, you don't have the alignment and so they just kind of tip in yeah what i've been doing is use it like kind of almost thinking of riding him out right in large like lawyer or just or using my like like using my body to kind of first i'm not even as far as enlarging yet we're just working on that it's like i try to get his shoulders to follow my shoulders, yeah, the shoulders. Um, so right now i'm not working on the back of him or even the middle of him i'm just like here you are we're like we're very like he doesn't we're not flexing we're not collecting we're, we're just like soft soft baby bird contact and it's like can you follow my shoulders with your shoulders back outside and then we ride the circle and then sort of like Mm, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm also wondering, yeah. I mean, I, I usually keep to that thinking of if a horse falls out over shoulder mm. or in, um, it's a lack of the hind leg being able to do its work. Mm. So so if a horse um falls in out both directions, I think it's just a matter of really not having the strength yet. Mm. So um then I would if it's a youngster, I would see if there is more preparation necessary um, with work without rider, or um, if because it is a strength issue, um, whether shorter rides help. Um, mm. I would experiment in that direction, and at least my experience with Frisians is that they often look big and strong, but they're they're really not. Um, and it, it takes quite a bit of time for them to develop the strength to be really a riding horse. Yeah. So, um, yeah, either ask that hind leg on that side, but also evaluate if it's 
too much still and mm -hmm. then prepare more would be one idea. That is that is terrific advice because <laughs> my horse, he does it one way a lot. And if you watch him from the ground, he is still like there's it's it's small, but mm -hmm. the the hind leg on the bad side on the outside that doesn't want to kind of take the take the weight to get the proper bend and alignment on the circle. It's mm -hmm. just a fraction. He doesn't step through quite as much with that mm -hmm. one. And so, yeah, what we've been doing is trying to address that without me <laughs> getting mm -hmm. him to lunge on a night lunge on the line that he, that he can handle mm -hmm. and build him up that way. And it's, mm -hmm. yeah, but it's slow. And, like it's and lunging also in straight lines, straight lines, corners, um, yeah. round lines. Um, I like, to do that, to give the horse the chance to kind of figure out how to do that. What I also have observed from others with those issues, very often, if there's one hind leg that steps less than the other, people drive that hind leg mm -hmm. like crazy. And I kind of like to do it the other way around. I like to tell the other leg that has the strength, hey, slow down, buddy, give mm -hmm. the weaker in in quotation marks hind leg to catch up with you so mm -hmm. to students with young warm bloods i always tell them write them cheaply so they mm -hmm. look cheaper than they are <laughs> small gates yeah. and then the horses kind of cannot catch up with all their parts and then the bigger gates more showy gates will come later yeah, yeah that's sure. really good advice yeah yeah, yeah so my experience is with that when normally horses will fall out in one direction and in on the other. That's crookedness, right? If they fall in in both directions, my first suspicion would be that the rider is sitting too much on the inside seat bone somehow in both directions. Because some people learn that, right? You steer by shifting your weight where you want to go. But if you shift your weight too much and you don't rotate your body, then you can get that effect that the horse turns like a bicycle in both directions or they fall in, right? So that, that would be the first thing I would check and then yeah when i have a horse you know when i have to ride a horse that does funny things i just play you know shift my weight in and out rotate left rotate right until i feel like okay here's my horse is comfortable right so basically this game of warmer and colder you know that we played as, as kids where well, somebody asks a question the other kid says warmer you're getting closer to the right answer or no colder you're going farther away from the right answer and you you can do this you can move in all kinds of directions and then the horse will get better or he'll get worse right that's a nice thing it, it's pretty binary so you just let the horse show you where you need to be and then you, you experiment a little bit yeah nothing wild and crazy so you don't freak your horse out but like smooth and a little bit slow movements and, and you will see okay now my horse feels a little more balanced or now i can take him out more or here he falls in more and so it's totally intuitive in a way, right? You just ex explore, like Catherine was saying, you have these different planes of movement, right? So that, that you can explore. And I always do that when I ride a horse I don't know. And, you know, with the young horses, you kind of have to do that too, because you need to figure out mm -hmm. where do I need to be so he can carry me and be balanced with me, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not always where you think it is. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do funny things yourself up there so that the horse is balanced, you know, so... Yeah. Well, and, and I think that, that, yeah, like, and you can, within that, like once it, once you go with them, then you can sort of use those tiny little moments. It's almost like you're explaining, like, mm -hmm. I want you to like, right now you're not, you know, you're not developed enough to ride a correct circle or just the mm -hmm. beginning. So I need you to just follow me. And mm -hmm. then you can say, okay, no, I just want you to slightly get off your inside shoulder. And it's, it, it's just a, it's just a moment. It's not like a, it's not a big pushy lesson. It's just, you start to, to have the, the beginnings of a conversation where they learn to kind of follow you and they learn that nothing bad is going to happen if they do. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's very important. Huh? Yes. With a young horse, I like to use a little bit of in a scenario like that, some stirrup stepping and guide the horse out with my weight. Mm -hmm. So I take the horse, invite the horse where I want to go with my weight and my energy. It's like a really directing, we're going over there, you know, <laughs> and using some stirrup stepping can be very intuitive for the young horse. It's not anything they have to learn. They just follow the weight because it speaks naturally to their biomechanics. If they have enough pushing power, if they have enough energy yeah. yeah if they have yeah. enough energy 
but a little bit of stirrup stepping every time they fall on the inside shoulder, you know, a little stepping into the outside pair of legs can be really, mm -hmm. really helpful with young horse. Mm -hmm. It's also, like if I may um, add to that, um, I don't know, I'm always about this issue with sitting in the middle so that you can work from there. So um, if you want to go a straight line with the young horse who is not yet balanced, you really might um, make space with your one um, seat bone for that hind leg to find its way under or let's say if I do write a circle um, I can negotiate in a way with the young horse and say hey I understand if you do a circle light your left hind is a little bit more under the weight I can make that part for now easier for you but that again is this thing I, I need to be able to find the middle in order to to balance things along as the horse might need it to be able to get to that line that I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, it just reminds me too that Kami Koka was talking sometimes about um, training the young horses in Vienna. They they had to ride the young horses with mm. two whips because you know the, uh, they were saying young horses don't know what a leg aid is, so so don't drive with your lower leg because the horse can doesn't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. And they use the whips for steering. So if you ride two whips and the horse falls in, you could touch the inside shoulder a little bit with the whip. It's and just so like move over. Of know. course, they're not afraid of the whip. So he exactly. also said you, they would sometimes even show the horse the whip, you know, next to the face, not touching the face, obviously, mm -hmm. but next to the face so that it, it's a visual barrier for the horse. No, you don't fall in here. And the horse, mm -hmm. you know, if they're not afraid of the whip, yeah. it doesn't cause a, you know, a shock for the yeah. horse to yeah. to do that and i remember uh, seeing a rider actually in a clinic ride like this with a whip on each side and doing the steering just with the whips yeah. in a, a lesson with him so that's true yeah. Yeah, he did that and mm -hmm. uh i mean and that's really old school i mean the, some of the baroque authors talk about that too it's like when you want to turn the horse you show the whip in front of the outside eye yeah and of course when the horse sees something come up there he's likely to turn away from it well, right? of course they're not going to so, go into yeah. it you know, so that you know most likely if you want to mess with it, that's something you, you can try. It could be interesting. It, it's always helpful to have many ideas, yeah. many tools. You know, you'll find that some of these will work more than others. Some of them will help address the issue and some of them are not going to at all. The point is to have many solutions for an issue. Yeah. Do you want to go to the next one? Yeah. Allison. Okay, Allison, yes, says, how do you feel and see which leg... Uh, the horse is waiting more when using Felden horse techniques like gentle rocking. So. Charlotte, do you want to? Oh, you're muted, Charlotte. Not mute. <laughs> Are you saying I'll start? I can start if you like, and then you can add. Um, so there's a there's a number of ways that you can do that, um, Alison. You can, if it's safe to stand behind your horse, you can directly behind. You can see from behind the 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 length of their spine maybe you can see already without even moving them which front leg they're a little bit more balanced on and then you can put your hands on their sitting bones um which are either side or just below the tail and you can start to gently shift your weight shift their weight and just see which shoulder they go more into so that's the first approximation or the first direction or you can stand to the side you can either stand to the side in the middle so that you're looking at shifting the weight to both mm. legs on the other side at the same time. Um, and then you may notice that the leg goes more into the front leg or more into the hind leg. Or mm -hmm. you can stand at the shoulders and shift the weight from the shoulders. Or you can stand at the front and you can shift the weight from the sternum towards one hind leg or the other. And mm. that will give you an idea of the, the, the leg that the horse moves most easily, followed by the second leg third mm -hmm. leg and the leg that they avoid at all costs mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Fun. <laughs> yeah it's fascinating Fun stuff. something you can also do that is in movement is what i sometimes have uh, at uh, when i have clinics here i sometimes have the students they are then two uh, they are two together with one horse and one is leading and the other one is walking uh, next to the horse and put their hands on different parts mm -hmm. and it could be for example that they should should uh, sense the difference and observe uh, between 
you can put your hands on the um, on the croup. Do you say that the croup? Yeah. yeah. For example, uh, or on the weather or any place actually. Uh, and you can also choose direction. So if you walk to the left and you uh, sense the inside, you can choose. You can change to the to go to the right, and you do the same. And you will uh, learn how to sense the differences. And then you swap roles, and you can discuss it. And uh, uh, many people get clearer about their horse's own patterns when that ha when they do a thing like that. And of course, uh, sometimes you can really see the connection to when you touch them in standing, like in the, the felon horse work in standing. Uh, but it can else also be that it's a bit different just because you start to walk. Mm -hmm. Not always the same. I, I find this part um, really, really beneficial because I I don't even want to know for how long I was actually riding and not feeling where the horse was putting the weight. Mm -hmm. And um, when you when you learn that via Felton horse, via um, walking with the horse and touching, you you get a much better sense. Um, that then you can transfer that feeling when you're in the saddle. And yeah. so you, you can spare yourself and the horses that you're working with um, mm -hmm. a lot of balance issues that you, you, that I back then just couldn't address because I was not aware of them. Yeah. 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 Very true. Very true. Yeah. Anything you do on the ground usually benefits you in the saddle. I find mm -hmm. whether mm -hmm. it's work, and the Felden horse or long reining, it's always you learn things because you see and you feel when you're on the ground. You can see how the horse moves, you can see how energy travels or doesn't travel through the horse. You can see uh, which which leg supports the most weight. Um and you know, when you're sitting on the horse, you don't see anything, you just feel or you have to. And if you don't feel, then mm, <laughs> you're out of luck. <laughs> so and and I think this this all this groundwork is a good way to develop your feel in the saddle. I was going to say, luckily, feel can be learned. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's get through a couple of these other questions. Yeah. yeah. So Heather McCann says Adele is stiff right, and my ongoing struggle is getting her to not fall into the inside front leg going right, especially at the end of the arena, where the door back to the barn is. <laughs> so she wants to look left at that point too. I know the problem is largely me. I know mm -hmm. I have a bad habit of leaning to the inside so I have to constantly think of more weight in my left side to offset the tendency I try to focus on getting her to shift her weight to the outside hind and enlarge the circle to shift her weight to the outside pair of legs but we're still struggling especially in that one corner well anybody ideas <laughs> I mean maybe this isn't the prescribed idea but I have a horse who does that a yeah. lot and actually, I just, um, in a sense, by cutting off the last five meters of the school where he was always looking out to see his friends or whatever, or because he was alert to the environment, mm -hmm. I, I think he learned then that he could balance himself around that corner, even though it wasn't exactly in the most, the place where he was truly avoiding it. And mm -hmm. then I found slowly we could get closer. Yeah. without him resorting to that because quite frankly i i didn't have enough strength or ability in my own body to resist his desire to look to the outside well, yeah i mean you have i had to... to be a little bit more creative yeah you have to choose your battles yeah. too yeah yeah you know? i mean he's a strong horse you know i'm sure your yeah. horse is strong too from what i remember so i'm yeah. sure she'll always win that one yeah yeah, yeah. and the, this is a smart solution yeah. yeah yeah definitely i mean you could start you know cutting five or ten meters off and then as the horse warms up and it gets focused you can gradually sneak up on that short side more and more and go a little farther towards the short side and so make your corner a little bit later yeah. another thing you can try is to ride spiral bolters that you start somewhere mm -hmm. on the long side and then you know you when you come across the quarter line or however big you make your your bolt is you enlarge and turn and so every spiral bolter you get a little closer to that corner and then hopefully the horse will be so engaged in the spiral vault, you know, it'll be such an interesting conversation 
that she'll forget about that corner and the door. And then by the time you get there, maybe she, she won't be interested in that door anymore. So it's like distracting her by occupying her brain, keeping her busy. Sometimes that works really well. If the horses are so focused on your conversation, if that's so mentally and physically challenging that there is no brain cell left to do anything else, then you know, they don't care anymore what's going on outside. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always work, but, but in some, some cases it does. I like to take the approach of taking, sorry, Marcel, (laughs) of taking preemptive action, Mm -hmm. you know, and basically before you get to that point already, bringing the horse into a a slight shoulder four position or even shoulder in if the horse can do that. But if not, just a a slight shoulder four so that you're going through and cut off the arena. Absolutely. Catherine's advice to do that. Absolutely. I I back this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And but do that and ride it right in a shoulder four position so you're giving the horse the habits in a setting where the horse isn't so inclined to look out so that later those habits are really well in place so that you can take them and carry them forward to riding further over into the corner or wherever it is that Mm -hmm. you want to ride that's more distractible this is a, a good way that i use with my horses especially when i'm riding young horses because they are distractible Mm -hmm. yeah marcella yeah just just chiming in along those lines um of course we want at some point to have horses on the seat where we can go anywhere um despite any distractions but um again this is something that's a very slow build up so i'm all for cutting corners <laughs> if, if they're <laughs> just not the right thing for now and then finding a way how to do things well and correctly um, bracing the horse and then add my goodness if it's five centimeters at a time where you get further to that place that causes some kind of stress or distraction and then that way the horse can come out of the work with you every time with wow I was really good you know wearing um, little halo and being very happy um, with himself and with his person and then you can add that over time and I think it's a much better approach than have than wanting to say well you have to go there um Mm -hmm. yeah people argue with their horses unnecessarily um and that can um create real relationship issues (laughs) and then that needs to be addressed so yeah smart strategy i think (laughs) definitely yeah yeah, and Maria Blomen says, when things get more complicated, for instance, lateral movements in a higher gait, I sometimes catch myself making more of an effort. This in turn can lead to me returning to bad habitual mm-hmm. patterns. In my case, uh, my left hip moves forward and my right back, my right side collapses, etc. This is really hard to overcome. Any no, this is really hard to overcome. <laughs> Walk outside, that, no. yeah. yeah, I've been there, done that. Yeah. I, I used to do that too. I think it's, it's you get suckered into it, right? In, in mm-hmm. the heat of the battle, you're riding a movement and then... Yeah, you know, absolutely. You'll return to all your bad habits. <laughs> so it's a Feldenkrais question, I think. Yeah, actually, I was going to say Catherine could really answer this well, because uh, there's something that happens when you fall into these habitual patterns and how to step back on them. I mean, my my general approach in those sort of situations is to um, say, OK, so I'm doing something which is beyond my coordination. So I need to back off a bit. So mm-hmm. if you're doing lateral movements in a higher gait, um, it may be that maybe you need to ask a little bit less so that you can manage let, manage it in a way that's coordinated and harmonious, let alone your horse. Yeah. Because for me, if I'm starting to really fight with myself, what am I really learning myself and what am I teaching my horse? I'm teaching them that this particular movement in this particular gait is a bit stressful for me and I don't really want to do that. So that would be... Sure. Sometimes we've got to get to the top of Everest and then we use what we have to use. But most of the time we don't. Yeah, that's my view. Mm. I like that. I like that when you were saying um, you're doing something that where you're not coordinated enough or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You don't have the coordination yet. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. It may be that you are coordinated enough to do that exact movement at a lower gait. That's very normal. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I can maybe hit an amazing tennis shot at a slow pace but then if i'm playing a player who's Mm -hmm. firing the ball at me at 80 miles an hour i can't Mm -hmm. 
because it's beyond my capability. My reaction times aren't good enough and my body is not grooved well enough into that shot to be able to respond to that more challenging situation. So the only thing I can do is chop back with tension. Mm -hmm. But it's exactly the same with riding. All sports yeah. are the same. It applies to the horses. There's time. Yeah. And it applies to the horses, yeah. Because it could be that you're riding a movement for which the horse is not coordinated enough in that in that gate. But now with a horse, I mean, of course, you can always go back to the walk, right? And fix things. And then when you're in the walk, start trotting again. We had that conversation in the German session there with Marcella and Yvonne. You could also um, reduce the angle. Like, it's, like if it's a, a lateral movement, you don't need to do the competition three tracks and, right. you know, 33 degrees and not one less, you know. But you could do just this. I always talk about these homeopathic doses, right? It's just move the shoulder half a hoof breadth, you know. And maybe that's the that's something the horse can do in the trot, but not the three tracks, right? I mean, I find that a, a lot, if you just reduce the angle, the horses can cope with it a lot better. Like half passes, if you ride a very shallow half pass on a horse that kills himself in a regular half pass, then just do a really, really shallow one and you get the feel and you get the spirit of it and you get the, the gymnastic benefit. Right. You know, and then the rest more comes. More than you would yeah. in doing a, a steeper angle in bad quality. Yeah. You know, the quality is far more important yeah. than the angle or or a faster gait or, you know, anything. You know, the quality is always, should always supersede everything else. So Catherine nailed my problem with the one Tempe's. Because... <laughs> That's exactly what like and it's and sometimes you have you're not doing you're not you don't have the coordination like you know what should happen, but yeah. you cannot your body it's not grained in your body enough that you right. can just do it. And the horse also is figuring it out. And mm -hmm. and, and like and so what beyond like the the backing up, like going back to things you can do so that you're not just creating a stress bomb for you mm -hmm. and the horse. Mm -hmm. Um is I've started trying to practice on the ground. So to figure out, okay, what's the mechanic that I have to do to do this movement? And for one Tempe's, it's actually skipping. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I skip on the ground in the arena. And it's really funny because my horse finds this horrifying. So usually I just turn him loose. He's not with the saddle, but we're, we're finished and we we're playing. And so he's at Liberty and I'm doing my thing. And so I'll start skipping and he just like, I don't know whether he feels frustration with us learning the the movement or or what why he does this, but he will like buck <laughs> and run around while I'm skipping. Like he's just right now, his whole attitude towards this is like that is like whatever you're doing. I just don't even know what this is. So I figure we're <laughs> like in the play, <laughs> we're kind of figuring it out separately, so that when mm -hmm. we put it together, it's not creating horrible problems because. I was at a point last year where I was like trying to get it and it was just making things, it, it was complicating our relationship so badly that I had to just stop yeah. doing it. And we had to like, and we just had to say, okay, it's not happening now. He's like, for whatever reason, I'm not, it's not enough in me. It's not enough in him. And mm -hmm. this is starting to, to go everywhere. And so we've just got to put it mm -hmm. on the shelf yeah. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and try again when it's, you know, when we're in a, a better, stronger, more developed place. Yeah, it's a good idea to, to do this on the ground because I was just thinking there's no way you can do one tempo changes slowly in the canter with a horse. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, it's not happening. So, but yeah, on the ground is good. Like and Marcella said, was it in the German session where you said you make students get off and walk sometimes? Yeah, yeah. You do the movements on foot. That That's often very helpful too. I find that too. Just to add, Maria, because I know you do the Feldenkrais lessons, um, what you can experiment with a little bit is find a lesson that you find a little bit challenging um, and do it super slowly so that you know that you're doing it at a pace where you can coordinate and feel smooth and then see how can you build it up and where is the point where your movement starts to feel cha chaotic? At what speed do you feel chaotic? At mm -hmm. what range do you feel chaotic? Is there a range which is this far where you feel in control? And then you push beyond that and you no longer feel in control. And I think you'll build up your coordination that way. Oh. And you can take that into standing exactly what Kristen is saying. You know, you can you can uh, generally the the principles of improving your coordination when you lose it are reduce the range, reduce the speed, reduce the effort, mm. pay attention to your breathing um, and then 
when you do that, you can slowly build from that point and, and add a bit more challenge and add a bit more challenge, but keeping those principles in mind. Yeah, that's very useful. Those are really good pointers. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, Maybe. Sometimes, I mean, just in, coming at it from, from a different angle, when you when you ride and you're suspecting that you're gripping too much, holding too much, you can always take your legs off and relax them again. I do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, like if you ride half passes, there's always this little bit of this temptation to just put the outside leg on and never take it off and just squeeze harder with every stride. <laughs> you know? Take a muscle yeah. force over. Yeah, so I I, it work? <laughs> I I often take a leg off and then relax it you know and you can do the same with your seat you can swing up and like am i sitting too heavily have i become like a brick you know too stiff too hard too dead you know then swing up move you know or move sideways like i said earlier or with the reins a little, give a little bit the überstreichen for some reason people only do this with the rain right this überstreichen but you can do it with everything you know with mm -hmm. your weight with your legs with everything and sometimes it's a really good feedback for yourself did I grip? Did I not grip? Because you don't feel it sometimes, right? And then when you take your leg off and relax it, then you realize, oh yeah, now I have a lot less muscle tension in that leg than I had before. Mm -hmm. You know, that was an issue I had. You know, I didn't feel how much I was squeezing, and I had strong legs. You know, so use what you have. <laughs> you know? Um, no. just to say that I have to go, everybody. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful, actually, to be on this panel with all of my fellow assistants and with you and Thomas and Shanna and for the for the great questions. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, um, but I do have to go, sadly. Yeah. But I hope to see you all in the course. Yes. yes. All right. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Bye. Bye. Yeah, we have to. We have to leave in half an leave hour. Leave in half an hour. So we have, have a little, little, little training more time. to do. Um, yeah. Let me see. More questions. Sabine Poro says that was also very helpful for me to find this neutral zone where no input from my side goes to the horse, just not disturbing the horse. Um, and there I, I need my middle, exactly. But also your comment, I think it was Toda, where you... Timing of the eight, for those who that don't know. Yeah, where you underlined that every eight needs to be released back to neutral. That was also helpful for sidestepping. The short moment where I release between the steps it seems to me that this is almost essential to enable sidestepping. Yeah. Mm. Very true. Like we were saying earlier, right? The space between the notes <laughs> is yes. almost more important. <clears throat> no, Frauke Jürgensen is now here from Facebook. And Terry Douglas says, yes, Marcelo Friesians often like stre strengthen the hind legs, agree to slow down the stronger leg. Mm -hmm. I um, think she has a Friesian. Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Heather Williams, very silly question. How do you weight one side? Mm. Charlotte. <laughs> That's a problem rise kind of question. So I ways. assume she means about the, the side, how, yeah, they, the how, the, yeah. the, how does the rider weight oh. one side of their themselves when riding? Um, yes. Um, you then need to, we talked about the midline and the middle and the neutral. So you you need to be aware of your seat bones uh, and how you have the weight distributed between the right and the left. And if you want to uh, give more weight to the left one, uh, you can, for example, just let it, so you, you take the, the, the hip pressed, let it go a little bit lower. That's one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but as Catherine was, in, was into before, it is also something you can you can do from the rib cage, and it has to do with how you are from the beginning. Because maybe you are um, what we usually in riding we call it collapsing in one side, which means that you shorten one side and you you lengthen the other. I now I do a very big moment, but sort of this, uh, and and then that. It's something you first need to, to sort of sense. And we have lessons about that in sitting in, in the course that like basic lessons you can do that Catherine uh, is teaching. Uh, but it can also be that you translate the rib cage, that that is your habit. Um, and then 
again, you need to be, you find the middle. So mm -hmm. if you have the middle, uh, you can either do, as I said, with the seed bone, but you can also do it in a way that you very, very little, uh, give a little weight from your uh, rib cage, but it's, it has to be really, really subtle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do it. Um, and you can do it by thinking from your leg, your, your foot. Uh, so you can think of uh, lengthening your leg, letting like letting the there be a little space in your hip joint between your pelvis and the the, the he head of the femur. Uh, that is also a way of doing it, uh, or maybe straightening your leg a little bit. And sometimes when you do it, you will find if you observe yourself that the other things are just happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. But often we have one way that is easier, easier to start, one, one part where it is easier to start from, to, to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I really like how differentiated um, one can do that. I mean, that, that was just real great just now. The other thing I'm, I was thinking of that too is that people, when they want to do that, um, very often on the horse, they do way too much. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I sometimes tell them, well, just kind of figure it out. If you stand on two legs and mm -hmm. you want to stand straight and in the middle and you have to stand for a very long time, um, mm -hmm. but you don't want to lean, um, you can distribute the weight from one side to the other. And from the outside, it's barely visible. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that we then can take into the saddle with the differentiation of where to do it that you just described. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's amazing because it aligns us to kind of speak to horses the way that makes sense to horses. Like horses are way more elegant at communicating than we are. They're way more subtle. Like they can, with tiny little things, they can like, and, and with their bodies, they, yeah. they do things like we just sit there and go, bah, 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 you know, their <laughs> mouth. <laughs> um, and so we, we tend to be screaming at them with our bodies, even when we don't feel like it. Like mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. That's true. Yeah, I, I'm really fascinated by that Feldenkrais idea that you can initiate movements from any number of places, right? Because in, in writing, it's usually, well, this is how you do it. There's this one way and this is how, you know, sit more on that seat bone, but that you can do it from so many different things. I mean, you can also even just move your upper body a little bit like a joystick, right? That will like already, the, the yeah. find your flow yeah. training that Catherine did the other day. She did a, mm. this was on YouTube, right. if anybody wants to find it. Um, you know, she did a, a short Feldenkrais lesson where we actually explored some of this yeah. and exactly it's this, you know, like the leaning tower, mm -hmm. you know, this is, you know, but there are other ways too. We, yeah, you know, exactly. we explored yeah. in a, the lesson some other ways. Yeah, there's a large number of ways you, you can get to the same place almost, right? And of yeah. course, some things will be easier because we feel that part of the body and then other parts are not accessible to us because we have you know no awareness of them right so yeah. it would be hard to initiate something from there but it's now you could you could make this into a little research project like you do some things like i shift my weight and we all have a way that we always do it we don't think about it we just you know we do it a million times and that's that's how it is right and then you can think well how else could i do that right, right? How else can I shift my weight from what, what body is like, you know, Charles was saying, can I start with my rib cage mm -hmm. to affect my seat bone? Can I start with my shoulder? Can I, you know, any number of places. Right? And I think that's a fascinating little research topic yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to explore in a ride. It could be a whole ride. It could be just, you know, exploring these explore things. These things right? Fascinating. Yeah. Um, and then you learn a lot about your own body and you learn. And also you may find that, my horse responds best if I initiate the weight shift from here, right? Maybe it's a different place than where you normally do it. So <laughs> endless possibilities. Okay. We have another question. Stephanie Witz, my horse has arthritis in her lower neck, C6, C7, with reduced movement in her left shoulder due to this and damage to the thoracic sling. Do you have any suggestions to help to her build this area again we are improving already by doing some of your movement patterns and improving straightness 
yeah, that will help a lot. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Does anybody have any ideas, suggestions? I think that Feldenhorst would will mm. be good to to start with. Mm. Uh, and of course, just from from that little information, uh, it's not so easy to really know what, what are you doing mm -hmm. right now. What sort of work are you already doing with the horse? Is it like still rehabbing, or or what is going on there? But yeah, felon horse is always very soft work, so you can definitely do that even if you have a horse that you're just um, mm -hmm. starting to get back to work. Mm -hmm. Lots that's, of comments. Yeah, it's interesting. So I'm, I'm just thinking, I don't have any real experience with horses that are arthritic in the lower neck. I don't know, Marcella, have you seen horses? Um, I was just thinking because this is a big issue right now and they're finding um, um, in a lot of breeds um, a, a certain genetic predisposition to this topic. And um, of course, there are a lot of vets out there who do a lot of injection and all of that. But there are also cases of horses that can be um, put back to riding um, and to 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 sound to soundness by really stabilizing the base of the neck yeah. and um, by by really having them um, um, kind of find that where they where they find a. a good balanced movement forward to the bit. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, I don't really want to say anything to such a specific case because there you really have to have a lot more detail to even start thinking about a potential solution. Yeah, but this is what what my what I hear and what works with some horses. Yeah. So Stephanie says yeah. we have uh, Veronica Reiden Yeah. But my um, is PVCM, what you're talking about, Marcella? Exactly, exactly. And this appears to be a, a finding that right now is just going through like wildfire. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I've heard people talk about it. I just haven't seen a horse, I don't think, that has it. But yeah, I mean, I would basically do careful gymnastics, right? I mean, keeping the base of the neck stable is something you should do with every horse, so that can, exactly. can never hurt, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then, yeah, you can try and mobilize the shoulders by, you know, how does the horse turn, like right a wall to right, right a wall to left? Um, how small a vault can the horse do, right? If it's too small, it gets uncomfortable, it'll brace, you know, things will go wrong. Then you may have to make it a little bigger, like maybe find what's the smallest turn the horse can do comfortably like in terms of bolt is left and right and then i would explore what can the horse do you know with and and still be balanced and supple and and uh you know uh, relaxed and and yeah if if it if you ask the horse to do something that hurts mm -hmm. or that is like you know beyond their ability then they'll brace and they'll there'll be some negative you know feedback from the horse so i think there's a lot of it probably that you have to carefully um try it trial, trial and error right and see what what can you do you know what's where's the limit what's the boundary and then <clears throat> can we move that limit a little bit further out <clears throat> over time and then yeah, time will tell i guess yeah. um, and then be careful with the reins you, you know not restricting the horse and and do a lot of things with with hands and the reins yeah Oh, Stephanie Witz says, are uh, Felden horse movements included in the what, why, how course? I shall not Felden horse in the what, why, how course? I know we have um, Felden um, race for the rider. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine would be the one to answer that because she's in charge of the Felden race into the program. She might. Yeah. I, I'm not sure about not it. I, I know it's in the in the top line makeover, and yes. we have, I'm not really sure which of the other courses we have included some of the fellow house working. Mm. Yeah. What did we leave off? Yeah, we have 15 minutes left. Either way. Uh, Stephanie says. I realized I was blocking my horse from using her left hand properly because my left hip, hip and pelvis was very stiff. 
Yeah, that's common, right? That mm. rider stiffness transfers itself to the horse. If, yeah, if, if you're, and vice versa. Yeah, if your left hip is stiff, the horse's left hip will become stiff and the left hind leg will step short. You know, so. Um, hold on a second. That was... Yeah. There were just comments to the other. Okay, thing. Terry was saying yes. about two ribs for this reason. Yes. Um, Chancellor Pell, regarding weight shifts, I've learned to pay close attention to what my horse does when I clean their hooves. I have one horse who mm -hmm. always brings his left hind forward when I go to his left front. Sometimes the subtle movements tell me a lot. Yeah, they do. Very good yeah. point. Yeah, it, it absolutely. Pays to be observant. Yeah. 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 Thousand crosses. This is so helpful. I think I will be able to see and feel it much better than when riding. Mm -hmm. and Julie Key says, lunging and groundwork has been a huge benefit to, to my horse. Yeah. And I love groundwork, though. It's so helped my connection. Yeah. Terry Castania says, love your comments, Marcella, on making the horse feel proud and happy with his work. <laughs> Heather says, thank you all for the great suggestions. Alison, love your idea of having the horse be happy in the person with a little halo, Marcella. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi says, I love uh, that we have this fantastic Naomi brain. Says, to, yeah. Naomi says, I love that we have this fantastic brain trust, brains trust available to bring such a wide range of experience and perspectives to supporting us in our training and development. I'm so appreciative of the passion and support you all bring to the courses. Aww. Yeah, I'm enjoying myself. It's it's fun because it's we nice. all have these little different angles that we come from and different backgrounds and stuff. So it's it's cool, right? So you get a, a much richer picture. We all benefit <laughs> from uh, engaging in a panel like this because oh, we can collaborate and share ideas and concepts and and it builds the knowledge for all of us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You could always get no ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Julie says, Naomi, I was just thinking exactly that. This is the most superb discussion we had so lucky. That's so sweet. <laughs> Janine Radke, totally agree. Naomi and Julie, Ricky Boving, same thing here. Just love it. <laughs> to me, Castania says, I watched a lesson one time where they were trying to get one team piece and it was a disaster. Just doing the same thing many times doesn't help. Exactly, it doesn't. Yeah, it's the drilling thing, right? Yeah. You, you don't get better by doing the same thing over and over. right? That's unfortunately still widespread, you know. So you just do the same thing badly yeah. <laughs> over and over and then the horse's brain gets fried eventually. Right? Uh, breathing, yes. <laughs> Carol Welch, Welch, always forgetting about the breath, so important. Yeah. Frau okay, Jürgensen, about concentration, we're still having massive issues with that uh, at the new yard. Been there for nearly a year now. Oh, wow, it's already... <laughs> yeah, once we get to the school, May tries very hard to concentrate and at times feels like her old self. <clears throat> but as soon as there's a noise outside, she turns inside out and her concentration is out the window. But mm. even harder is getting to the school in the first place as we have to walk up a very long track past very open fields. She's not at all keen on this and frequently turns into an equine statue staring at whatever in the distance for the moment. I've taken the pressure off entirely and I'm trying to turn the track into a positive place with lots of clicker training and banana chips, but I'm feeling very discouraged at the moment. Yeah. Perhaps I should be looking for a smaller yard like to ride again eventually. Actually, I would say, yeah, she's telling you she's not comfortable there. She doesn't feel safe for some reason. Yeah. And that's my immediate feeling that um, as nice it, as it can be to ride in a, a nicer mm. facility, a bigger facility uh, if it's not right for the horse it's not right for the horse yeah horses are funny they can be perfectly happy in yeah. one barn and then you go to another barn their basket case you know yeah. very tense and very nervous and it's like and you you may not even know why that is it's just their energy isn't right for the horse you know there's some sometimes they're very grumpy unhappy people at barns and the, the horses will, will respond to yeah. that yeah um so it sounds like you're hand walking the horse right okay. from the barn to the arena because that would, would be my mm -hmm. suggestion if riding it there is too hard hand walk but if you're doing that it's not really helping them yeah but mm -hmm. you know she's tense and, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah unsure unsettled yeah. yeah she's telling you something right they they only have so many ways of communicating with yeah. us and you have to read their behavior and you can either guide her to be more comfortable if that's your only option or if you have another option to take her to another place where she's going to be more comfortable yeah. i would pursue that yeah some barns some arenas can be spooky if there's a lot of noise outside but the horses can't see where it's coming from i've, I've ridden in barns where 
-hmm. for some reason the acoustics yeah there were any any noise in the parking lot outside would get reflected off the arena roof and mm -hmm. then it was like amplified inside it was like way louder than it should be and then the he horses hear all this hoof you know clatter and people talking and all kinds of noises and they couldn't see where it came from and that was always unsettling especially if there's it, any tension mm -hmm. in the with the people and this the mm -hmm. the horses all feel it they feel mm -hmm. it and it it bubbles up in weird ways. Yeah. So the other thing that, I mean, I'll just throw out there is because it happened with one of my horses, but also I think Catherine had a similar thing with QQ is um, what's going like, it might be stuff that's going on when you're not there. It might not, might not be the yes. space. It might be like, I mean, because a lot of these big things, the horses are coming and going and so they can't make relationships um, I know my horse, my, my thoroughbred blossomed when we got him out of sort of boarding situations where he, he wanted a friend and he could, yeah. every time he made a friend, they would take the, you know, the friend would come and go or whatever. And he just felt very shut down. He became a completely different horse when he got into uh, a more, a more stable, quiet situation where he had relationships the other 23 hours of the day, I wasn't riding him. And I think, I think Catherine's horse had a similar thing where she changed where she was keeping him and it was it was more settled it wasn't as big mm -hmm. it wasn't as busy he had friends he could go outside and that I mean so it's not just their relationships with people it's their ability to have relationships with each other that also point for that yeah that's a absolutely. good point yeah absolutely mm -hmm. yeah that's very true yeah, it's it's not good if if the there is not a like a stable herd kind of situation, but if there's always horses coming, horses going, you're moving in, moving out, and then they can never really establish, you know, friendships, bonds, whatever, with with other horses. So yeah, it's difficult. These big barns are always difficult, I find. Yeah, and and what's also so important, um, um, and sometimes you don't even know what's going on, how the staff treats the horses. Um, and what kind of mood um, they're in when they're feeding and all of that. Um, it really depends on on certain horses. Um, some of it you can you can balance out thanks to Felton horse. Um, <laughs> but if there are real serious issues um, where staff abuses a horse in her stall or something, then um, yeah, it's time to move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Falke was saying she's still with her BFF Benji <laughs> in one paddock and she's really not keen on being out of sight of him. I think the other horses in the other paddocks are a worry. Mm -hmm. You could bring the other horse with you and tie him somewhere while you're working her. That's a possibility. If, that, if they allow it, if, if, you, if you can, you know, it makes it a little bit more effort. But uh, she seems to get security from her friend. And if she can't see him, she gets insecure. It seems like it. Yeah. So if there is any way you could take both horses down, just tie one up or turn him loose somewhere and then then ride the uh, ride May. Um, Another but... thing that I'm also thinking, if horses are moved, it's a little bit like trauma bonding. So yeah. one might have to start um, separating them like we're going five minutes in this direction and then we're going back and then kind of start a little bit longer or something like that, that can also play a big role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Which of course takes a lot of time and effort. <laughs> it does. Yeah. 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 But, you know, yeah. it's a lot of effort to deal with a horse that's uncomfortable and unhappy too. Yeah. You know, so. Well, yeah. and, and all the best stuff takes time and effort. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so we do need to wrap it up. Um, we've been we've gone almost two hours now. Can you believe that? <laughs> there are so many thank yous in here. People loved this. Yeah, Luke wants us to do this every week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if everybody has time every week. I don't know if it's possible, but thank you. And we will we try to do it. We will try to do it more often. We yeah. actually also are enjoying it too. Yeah. Um, so we will try to do it more often. Yeah, they're all saying great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you everybody and uh and thank you everybody everybody for watching and thank you right. yeah. the rest of you for participating with yeah, us no, with this. this is yeah. great. Yeah. I really enjoyed it.
And so I just want to remind everybody that these are our fellow instructors in our courses and our current um, big course is open for enrollment right now. That's the What, Why, How course. And it's open right now. It starts tomorrow. Yeah. So we'd love to see you in the course. If yeah, you're exactly. And yeah, all of ready. these ladies will answer your questions, yes. comment on your video. They're all, all in there as instructors in the course. Yeah, yes, exactly. If you want more of that, you can get it all there. <laughs> get all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. See you next time.